Tonight we begin with the poorest city in the nation and the most dangerous city all in the same place. It's Camden, New Jersey, right across from Philly. Camden is a city of 77,000, a place most people avoid or take pains to drive by, a place I first covered 25 years ago. And as we found upon our return there, the story of Camden cannot be avoided anymore. Well, change the world with the 808. Back when Michael Joel hit that fade away. That's why we thank the Lord and pay homage to the ones who came and paved the way. My mama told me that I had a couple shoulders and taught me how to look go wrong when I'm older. She told me that I had a couple shoulders and taught me how to look go wrong when I'm older. I know this seems cold, but I promise you, you understand when you're older. Baby, when you're older. I promise you. Hello, everybody. How are you? I would like to formally introduce you, to, uh, welcome you to the first Conversations in Camden. My name is Chris Hampton. I am Champ I Am, motivational speaker, leadership development leader, and also a community leader in Camden. Uh, we're going to have a casual conversation, and how we're going to work it out is we're going to have a conversation with Kevin Livingston, and we're going to open it up also at a section for questions and answering at the end. So uh, we want you to enjoy this, and you are. Uh, participating in history, hopefully the first among many conversations in Camden. Welcome. <laughs> Kevin is uh, the founder of 100 Suits for 100 Men, and we're going to learn more about that organization of, that he has been able to develop in New York and see if we can reproduce the same effect and success here in Camden, New Jersey. So, Kevin, again, um, Let's just start a little bit about getting to understand who you are. Awesome, awesome. So my name is Kevin Livingston. Thank you, Camden. Thank you so much, uh, AJ. Appreciate you, you and your husband. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, guys, for hosting me. Um, I really appreciate it. His sister reached out to me. and It was like a dead set of winter in New York. <laughs> and um, she showed a lot of enthusiasm. So I thank you for following through. All right. Um, so I'm Kevin Livingston. I'm from Jamaica, Queens. Um, home of um, 50 cents and Donald Trump. <laughs> we ain't gonna talk about that. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so that's a little bit about me. Okay, well, what we wanna learn, because we know we're gonna learn about the, uh, the founder and CEO, mm -hmm. uh, I wanna learn a little bit more about the man, Kevin. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a little bit about who you are as, a, you know, you said you have a, you told me out there you have three daughters? You have three daughters, oh, wow. three daughters, yeah. yep, 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 <laughs> uh, yep. Right on, right on. I have a 23-year-old, a 20-year-old, and I have a three-year-old. <laughs> and I have three granddaughters. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because <laughs> more and we're going to have a lot of people coming from outside of our city, so we want to make sure we know, you know, the person and what's going on. Uh, you uh, shared in one of your videos uh, some of the challenges that you faced before 100 Man Suits, um, 100 Suits for 100 Man, excuse me. Could you share some of the challenges that, that led to you becoming the person that you are today? I mean, we, we have enough time. <laughs> I'm a product of being told no to. So, I mean, you know, I've heard more no's than anybody else. You don't understand? But no is good, right? Because when somebody say no, it means you want to know more information. So I keep going. Um, so, I mean, typically, you know, I, I was kicked out of high school in, in, uh, after my ninth grade of, of education, uh, told that I never went to class which I didn't. I actually sat in the nurse's office all day because <laughs> she was fine. <laughs> Being honest, I don't want to lie to you. <laughs> it's around about the time I had my first daughter. Um, I had typical uh, two kids before I was 20 years old. Um, so kicked out of high school. And when I left high school, I remember uh, looking in the New York Times and applying for this stockbroker trainee position. Now mind you, I'm fresh out of high school. Didn't know what I was going to do, had no formal education, so I went ahead and I applied for that position. It was a cold caller position, $150 a week. This was in 96. So I went on an interview, it was at a, a 20 Exchange Place, which is in downtown Manhattan. Got the job, started working. Two years later, the NASD came in and shut down the firm, it was Mob Brand. So for two years, I worked as a, a cold caller for the Bonanno family who ran this firm, which is, if you ever Google it, it's called Monitor Investment Group and Euro Atlantic Securities. This is where I learned my hardcore selling. Mm -hmm. This is where I learned my passion 
anything you've read, you, is, it, one movie that depicts what we went through in um, on Wall Street was this movie called Boiler Room. Boiler Room. <laughs> that movie is so accurate and so serious. Um, you know, I learned a lot from them. Um, a lot of guys who I'm who I started with are, is not unfortunately not here, um, but I still keep in contact with a couple of them, and um, yeah. So I, I, I learned a hardcore selling under a mob ran chop house. Yeah, you learn, you'd be surprised the things that you learned from the jobs coming up. But one of the things that you shared in your video was that you went from, you actually have a, a testimony of being homeless and surviving Absolutely. that as well. I, share a little bit about that experience. Absolutely. So um, in 2015, 14, I received, well, so let me just backtrack a little bit. I was working as a waiter for eight years. Um, and I hated that, and I wanted to do something different. I didn't have a high school education, so I went and got my GED, and then I went to college, got kicked out because my grades were too low. And so I started working in restaurants. I, went, I worked in every restaurant in Jamaica, Queens. And um, I applied for a branch manager position in the bank. They liked my ambition so much that they kept me as a customer service rep. And I was there for 10 years, in which I started learning the ins and outs. And I remember, I kept looking at this check. There was one account particularly, and I gotta say this here. I, I opened an account for a young lady, and the bank wound up opening an account with the hospital. This is all through my doings, right? I remember going to the meetings with the CEO and teaching and learning all these things. And mind you, I'm only making $42,000 a year, right? This deal was in the millions, right? And I remember coming back, and, and it was just a simple pat on the back. I got pissed off. So, I already knew what I was going to do with 100 suits. And I remember looking at my check, and it was $786 after taxes. And I said, this is what shows me how much they think I am worth bi-weekly. They put a cap on my ambition. I closed my book. I have never looked back ever since. I wound up opening an office, my first office, right across the street from the same bank that I was sitting at, very frustrated. So the birth of 100, 100 Suits for 100 Men came out of you being unsatisfied with where you were at that time. The, the, the entrepreneurial aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Around the corner from where I was at is an active blood site, very active in Jamaica, Queens. And I remember I hated seeing people ostracize these young men. They would walk across the street, walk around them um, versus engaging them. And I remember I was in a Popeye's. This lady next, door to me, next to me took a photo of a guy with his pants sagging and began to berate him online and then send it to her on social media versus interacting with this young brother. So I asked the customers in the bank, I said, hey, listen, if you guys have any um, business attire, please donate it. I'm going to go bring it around the corner. If you Google 100 Suits for 100 Men, you'll see a rack inside, in front of Popeyes, right in front of Popeyes. That was my first pop-up shop seven years ago. We put suits out there. And so that was the initial thought of 100 Suits was is that we were going to buy 100 suits for 100 gang members. That was the original plan. So I dropped the extras and it became 100 Suits for 100 Men. So you saw... You saw so basically, you saw the problem, and instead of complaining about it, you tried to make a change about it. I, I don't even know what trying is, right? So, so like, we, we, we moved on it, right? Like, I, it's, I always tell my guys this all the time. It's either do or you don't, right? You, there's no room for stutter stepping when you're about making change. Because while you're walking, somebody else is running. And that's with anything in your life, right? And so, um, yeah, I remember going, the first meeting I went to about 100 suits, I remember going to the community board meeting and I, I was telling them what I was doing and what I wanted to do. And, and I remember two particular board members snicker at each other while I was up on the mic. I said, I don't need y'all. I make my own thing happen. So I went and got a, a cardboard box. I made 100 suits through Word, <laughs> posted it on there, smacked it on there, and just started having people donating to the tire, right? And I remember when I, when I initially brought all the suits over there and the look on these brothers' faces that somebody actually uh, is not judging them, right? And like, if you wanted the second one, if you Google, again, some of this stuff is still online. If you Google 100 suits and go to videos, you'll see me putting suits in front of uh, a liquor store because um, that's, we was having a gun, buy back, a gun buyback program and I was donating suits to guys who were turning guns. But the people who were turning guns, they look like you and me. Mm -hmm. Too right? soft. So, and I brought it across the street to an active gang site. You can hear one of the guys in the video say, don't trust them. <laughs> but it is what it is, right? So that, that was uh, one, the, you know, how it was moving, right? And we had the support of Sean Bell's father. He came out and stood with us. Um, um, Eric Gardner's daughter, you know, later years. Uh, and we'll talk about that. And, and, and what gets me is um, how important self-image is, and, and amongst, especially amongst our young people. Um, when you talk about self-image, what does that mean to you and how do you relay the importance of self-image to our younger generation? In my, in, my, in my offices, we have a 
uh, a mirror. Uh, it's called the boutique effect, right? So we have the guys, before they leave out, men and women, look in the mirror and ask them, what do they see? And some people, like, I'll give you an example. Last week, this guy was in our office and I was just happened to be in the office while my, my assistant was taking care of him. And, and, he, and the guy mumbled. So I got up and I said, brother, what do you see? He was like, uh, I see the tie's not correct. You know, I don't like the color. I said, okay, let's switch the tie. Let's show him how to tie the tie. We did that. I asked him again, brother, what do you see? This brother was like, um, I guess a provider. Um, I guess I'm in a suit. I said, brother, you the one who said you have a daughter, you have a job, you have a roof over there. I see a provider. I see a king. I see somebody who eyes are in front of him for a reason. This brother, come to find out, just did 34 years in prison. 34 years. He didn't see that walking in. When he walked out, he walked out with a crown on his head. We have boutique experiences. We have half hour appointments for each person. And I have a tailor on site and a bar. And we were talking about the boutique. So explain, uh, when we talk about the boutique, that there's, there's so many dimensions that they have, a, what, the free haircut, the mm -hmm. tailored suit. And, and most people don't know what a tailored suit was. I was watching, um, <laughs> was that, the, uh, the Denzel Washington movie that just came out when he was the lawyer. And he would walk around in a frumpy, untailored suit. And you probably see people just wearing a suit just for suit's sake. But what's the difference th that, uh, the feel of a tailored suit compared to when you know a suit's tailor-made for you? Well, listen, most importantly, and the reason, you know, I, I, I get that part, but I, I, I put the tailor in there because a lot of guys never had that experience, mm -hmm. right? We want them to have a boutique. When they come in, they get they measured, their arms out, and uh, uh, they get the one-on-one -on -one co uh, conversation. We have a haircut booth in there. Um, we have mentors that come in there. Like, this is all incorporated within a half hour, right? They, they get the, the, sh the tie tying session. They pick their suit. They, you know, get it fixed, whatever have you. I wanted to be out the box with what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I wanted the men to know that they're kings, and I wanted the ladies to know that they're queens. Now, there's a lot of resources for women in New York City. A lot, a lot of bottomless closet, dress for success, and everything like that. But for men, it's far and few, mm -hmm. right? And if it is far and few, it's not consistent. Now, although I have, you know, an office in Manhattan, Queens, um, Brooklyn, and in Rikers, and um, in, in Queens Parole, but for seven years, I didn't have none. I was running it out of my truck, out of my bedroom. Somebody that needed a suit, I just jumped right over there to them. So it, that's, that's one of the things I... You know, um, you, you mentioned the tie thing. I'm going to come back to that. I, I wanna, actually, I'm going to... Because uh, I, I said something to you, and you said this must be a New Jersey thing. So if anybody <laughs> from New Jersey recognized what I'm about to do, then you just proved a point. Okay, how important is it that a man know how to tie a tie. It's very important. And why? So one is it could be a teachable moment with a male and his son, right? That's the main reason why we do it. Now we do this thing called tie tie in tournaments. We got two young people and we have them tie, tie against each other in three different ways. And they have a time limit, it's a tournament style and they win a PlayStation at the end. So it's, think of it, it's like everybody's clapping. Yeah, and they, they got the ties right, it's so awesome. Uh, we've been doing that, and, and so they are learning how to tie ties in different ways. So, I, I, which draws me back to your point that, for me, I started that to show the men so they can have a turnaround moment with their sons. Any fathers in here, in the room? All right. Uh, how many of you fathers learn how to tie a tie from your father, and how many learn to tie a tie from your mom? How many learn from your fathers? How many learn from your mom? How many of you done this? You learned from somebody because they tied the tie up for you. And then what happened was we do this. And every time we get out of the tie, we put the same old tie on. And then we get back done. We take the tie back off. And then after three wins, we get this little knot that doesn't even recognize the tie. It, it, it must be a Jersey thing because he didn't know, he didn't know anything about it. I swear, I, as long as I've been in Jersey, I thought it was, it was either that or the clip-on. But, <laughs> but now we've known, now that I realize that this is a Jersey thing, I'm going to take pride in it and say we got to do better. But, uh, <laughs> but I mean, you'll be surprised how many mothers know how to tie ties and to the women that are in the room, yeah. and, and, they're, and they're tying the ties for their sons. But um, what we're going to do as a, break, a, a brief intermission is we're going to learn how to tie a tie today. He's going to instruct me. Now, I know how to tie a tie. Mine's is the wind's in Yes, yeah, we're going to do. He's, he's, oh, oh, good. So I, I won't look like I don't know what I'm doing. Right. So when you do a Windsor knot, you want to make sure the short end is up by your neck. Mm -hmm. All right. And then you come around this way here. Okay. All right. 
Now you take this and go around. You're gonna double knot that again. Okay. Yep. Inside? Mm hmm. All right. So what you're doing is you're gonna be creating a base for your, your, your knot, right? You're gonna go around. And you're gonna bring it through this side. Okay. Underneath. All right, so you're gonna tug on this a little bit. All right, so basically when you see this, it should be like, it look like it's tied from the inside, but outside. Mm -hmm. You're gonna come around again. Wrap All right, around. yeah, not too tight. You wanna make it full, okay. right? And then bring it up and under. Right here? Mm-hmm. Oh, no. <laughs> so what happens when you have a full winder, I did this a little short, you have a V, a V, a V uh, thing here. The Windsor knot is very distinguished. When you walk into offices, people pay attention. There's certain, there's certain shirts that you wear uh, that go that complements a Windsor knot. Um, Jay Z. This is the reason why I started doing Windsor knots. Jay Z. I'm a big fan of Jay Z, and he used to do the real big fat Windsor knot. It's certain ties. Like this is too light. It's a, like a, a woolly kind of tie. Just the best to do a thick Windsor knot, and 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 the way he wore it was just epic. So. One of the things that we recognize if you review your sites uh, a little bit is you're starting to get more of the celebrity attention. Um, Colin Kaepernick, you said Snoop Dogg, um, you know, the different other players that are there. How did you grow to that extent? Did well, um, in 2015, we were featured in, um, well, thank God, we were featured in Jet Magazine and Black Enterprise. Um, we were, um, I was named BE's B Modern Man. And so they did a spread on African-American business owners throughout the country. I have no idea how they found out about us. Um, but Jet Magazine, I've been emailing them for years. <laughs> and they finally sent back an email saying, we'll look into you. And then I got an email back saying, OK, send your story. Um, and then I did an interview. So, um, so it, was, uh, it was through that. Then um, when we had met with um, Colin, a lot of people don't know. I'll give you a funny story about how I met with Colin Kaepernick. And, which led on to Charlemagne the God, Snoop Doggy Dog, um, Steve Harvey, um, Michael Strahan, um, people from there. Um, I met Colin Kaepernick. Then he invited me to come to his Know Your Rights camp. I brought about 45 young men, and uh, we, we hung out with him all day. And then Colin had said, Kevin, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come by your office. And I said, okay, you know, you, you hear that, whatever have you. Um, and I got a call. This is a funny story. Um, it was Saturday morning at 11, and, and his assistant, now mind you, they didn't tell me he was coming. They were just saying that I have some stuff for you. I said, okay, well listen, I'm running late. I'll be there about 12.30. Because I had my daughter with me. My daughter's kicking my behind. <laughs> so I said, look, I'll be there about 12.30. And um, they was like, um, okay, we're here. I said, listen, what do you want me to do? I got my daughter here. So I said, you can go around, I'll be back though. I get there at 12.30, Colin comes out in a black SUV and brings two huge things of suits, of his personal suits. These suits are well over 30, I mean, at least $30,000 each. They have very, very well-tailored suits. They still have the emblem made for Colin Kaepernick in there. Uh, he helps me bring, bring them out, you know, put them on the, uh, in front of my office, which is at parole. Um, and um, I remember turning to Colin and I said, Colin, listen, you know, you really stood up for us and I appreciate you doing, but I don't see nobody standing up for you. Which led for me, which led me to be the first person in the nation to hold a I stand for Colin in front of the NFL headquarters, mm -hmm. which we had close upwards of 150 people show up. Um, we shut down New York City. <laughs> oh my God! Um, and that went on and spread nationally. Um, and he never forgot that about me. You know, he said, Kevin, you know, before all this hip hoop lie, you were the first person to do it. We had it ran in New York City. Miami, Milwaukee, Sacramento, Detroit. This is all on the same day. Everybody did something for Colin. Um, and um, I received death threats through that. I, I mean, I had to have my own security that day because somebody told me they were gonna put a bullet in my head if I show up. Um, I got called all kind of N-words. I still have the emails. I could pull them up for you. You can see the racist emails I was getting. Um, and so um, we did that. Colin donated to our organization. Um, about eight months later, he donated, it was, I think it was 33000 towards our Rikers Island outreach. Um, so, and you actually got a chance to go into the prison with them as well. Yeah, so we brought, yeah, I had showed a video, they showed a video, right? Yeah, so that was when we had uh, just came off of Rikers Island. 
Um, and uh, the guy actually who read the letter to Kyle is coming home Wednesday. So I'm really excited about that. You know, I, I run a Crip house, I run a Blood house, and I have a G uh, Folk Nation house mm -hmm. in Rikers Island. We're in the GMDC building, a building which is slated to close under Mayor de Blasio. Um, he's closing down Rikers Island, and my building is the first, first building to be closed. Uh, we, we work with men 18 to 21. 80% um, of my guys are facing attempt murder charges and gang assault. And so I, I, I have a letter um, of some of the young men that I would like to read to you. It's not a full letter. Mm -hmm. Sure. What I wanna, while he's getting that letter, what I want to really, because we have a lot of visionaries that are sitting in this group of people that are here today, and I want to make the connection of, you know, being fed up with your nine to five to go for your purpose. And it wasn't until he decided to leave being a waiter and look at him. If, if seven years ago, and this didn't count, count, you know, the celebrity didn't just, just happen. It, it happened because he was faithful to the plan, but he was also willing to be able to say, I'm not going to stay where I'm at now and make that transition. Let me, let me, let me explain this to you, and I, I, I'll talk about this in a second. You got to follow your passion. Because when you follow your passion, success follows you. Real recognizes real. So when you're doing it for the heart and not the money, everything comes behind you. You know, what always got me crazy was people say, oh, I didn't get funding to go do this. I didn't get funding to go do that. Well, just go do it. We have enough skill sets in our community to make change. Like right now, if I move to Camden right now, you best believe I'm starting something right away. You wanna know how? I'm gonna go around the room, I'm gonna ask you, what do you do well? I'm gonna find out what skill set that is. We're gonna incubate that, and then we're gonna go right to the street. We're not waiting to a month or two from now. We're gonna start Tuesday, right? Like I'm serious. Like we don't wait, right? You know, there's just too much people waiting for elected officials or waiting for a corporation or for a grant. No, I didn't wait. How many times I failed? I love failing. I just don't like getting not getting back up, <laughs> right? Like you have you have to fail. That's how you learn how to walk. And you say failure is, 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 is not that you are a failure. There's a problem in the process. I learned this from my good buddy Keith Perrin, who's a co-founder of FUBU. If I fail more than you do, I win. That's awesome. That means I'm trying more than you. That means I'm not doing a monthly event. That means I'm not doing a quarterly event. I'm out there every day. So there's no perfect time to start. Start. We can start today. Matter of fact, we should do something today. Matter of fact, we should actually go around. Well, I'm, I'm not going to take it, but I want to ask everybody if you can let me know what skill set you have, and then we should put this into something. And you can start an email, and then we can. I'll come back out. To, I'll come out. I'll come back out the camera. I can't come back out this week, <laughs> but I'll. I'll because we will hold you to it. No, no, I'm a man of my word. <laughs> Lord knows, I'm a man of my word. That's all you got. That's all you got by your man. <laughs> And so you guys are man. But seriously, you have you have everybody has a skill set here, right? We can put all that together and move. Well, that's the, that's the key to growth is, and I think that there's a generation that doesn't understand that. But the key to growth is collaboration. Yeah. That we can do more together than we can do apart. Uh, gone are the days where you're trying to keep your nut. Listen, we can all eat if we can put all the nuts together and make it work. And, and, and Camden is big enough city to make it an example city to do that. So we're, we are, we're surrounded by visionaries here. So you got the right people in the room. And again, conversations in Camden, this is only the beginning. So this is the beginning of our movement in, in, in the city of Camden for change. So I'm glad you said that because they needed to, somebody out there actually needed to hear that. We're, 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 Don't be afraid to fail. Don't be afraid if nobody's hearing you. Let your actions speak much louder than your lip service. That's right. Yes. Lead by example. Seriously, I mean. Could you read us the letter and then? So it says, while we understand some members of society believe that anyone that is deemed deserving of ill treatment while we are not, while we are still incarcerated, have us committed, still having us have committed some serious crimes, we are still human. To be human is to be all we want is an opportunity for a second chance. Many of our young men in this housing unit do not have family or positive role models and that are constantly reminding us of our failures. Colin Kaepernick has provided opportunities for us, young men, and his investments in 100 Suits for 100 Men, a program which provides young people suits that cannot afford them, a program where we are honored to be a part of. Our past does not define our future. I gotta put a period on that. Our past does not define our future. 
That is the exact approach you have to have to young people right now. Your eyes are in front of you for a reason. You ready to walk, I'm walking three steps with you. But you gotta make that first step. Mothers, let your sons grow up. One of the biggest crutches I have right now is a mom that does everything for their son. So I get it, we'll get calls from my, to my office and, and mom's like, my, my son needs a, a, a suit. Okay, mom, give your son my number and have him call me personally. I've been called all kind of a-holes, <laughs> you know, dismissive. But we have to teach our young men how to be responsible and, and take ownership. There is a sense of entitlement amongst this generation. I have to say that. But so what? <laughs> We can stop that now, but just starting with us, right? right? Seriously. Um, so for me, that, that line is epic. And this young man, our past does not define our future, was charged with attempted murder, a very violent crime that was all over New York City. I even know when I went in there, his first offer was 32 years in prison. He just beat his charge. They found him not guilty. I'm actually working on an exit plan for him now. We're getting him supportive housing so he could be released within four months. Mm -hmm. He's been in Rikers Island for four years. Four years. The, the thing what you just said about we're not our past, if you want to be real, we all have that closet that we want nobody to look into. <laughs> okay? We all have something in our lives that we, have to, we don't want to be judged by. And I think we need to be able to afford that same courtesy. Once you do your time, You've done your time. You need now. We need to be able to have action plans to get you back into the city. Um, I serve. I, I do prison work as well. So I do, you know, go into prisons as well. And that's one of the things that they're they're saying is a problem is that they're. This, it's like an open door. You know, the, the same people are coming right back in. And um, so it's just to see that you have one part of the answer and it's working for you in New York. It gives us hope for the people that are working down here doing the same thing. Absolutely. So my company is, is, is structured in literally all forms of criminal justice in New York City. We are in Rikers Island. We run an eight-month curriculum program with three housing units. When they come home, I have an office in parole. We have a strong partnership with probation workforce development team for the state of New York. So when the young men are coming home, we send them straight to probation workforce, they go get work, they go get a job. Everybody in my unit, when they come out of jail, get a free suit, a boutique experience, and then we send them to work. I'm preparing for one of my guys to come home on Wednesday. Uh, he's being released to a shelter. I'm gonna meet, when I come back from LA, I'm gonna meet him at the shelter, and um, we're gonna get him his, his, uh, his uh, re-entry plan in place. I have one of my counselors, I hire a few social workers, and we have, we, they, he, they meet with my social worker, we find out what's his next steps, we develop them, and then we walk, we move. There's no time, time doesn't wait for no man. And they know I'm intense about that, that's probably why I have blood pressure now. But, <laughs> but you, you, we move, you can't wait on no man, so yeah. Man, I can't wait to get from these young people. We, we, <laughs> we have so much that we can really put out today, and I just wanna take thank you for coming into Camden and sharing your testimony, yeah. your heart. Um, we, we need to see more of that in our community. We need to see more people like us, um, not just even bringing it into a color issue, but we need to see more male black leadership. We need to see diversity in our leadership. And, um, and we need to see that. You are an example of what is possible in our community. So when we see you, even if you never come back over this bridge again, we know that what you do <laughs> is possible. Let me just tell you something. You do not need a 501c3 to get started. Don't let nobody tell you that stuff. Don't wait, don't wait. Don't let your work speak much louder than what you're talking. That's the thing I want to give to you. That's what I did with 100 suits. I let my work speak. Because when your work starts speaking, everybody's going to follow you. Yeah. So get started. Because they take notice. Get started. Word of mouth. Mm -hmm. People talk. But don't let that 501c3 or the whatever, don't let that stuff stop you. I didn't get a 501c3 until five years later. And I was forced to get a 501c3 because of my first contract. I didn't want to, because I wanted to show the community y'all talk too much. Y'all yeah. talk too much. Let's see the action, baby. So with that, because we have to, uh, we're wrapping this up, I want to again <laughs> welcome you. You have a welcome, uh, you have a welcome to come back. Thank you. And we thank you for coming and sharing. And uh, you made history today, whether you realize it or not, because you were our first speaker of, uh, of welcoming to Camden and a conversation 
in Camden. So again, we thank you, uh, Captain Livingston. Hey, Roman changed the world with the 8 away. Back when Michael Joel hit that fade away. That's why we thank the Lord and pay homage to the ones who came and paved the way. My mama told me that I had a couple shoulders and taught me how to look over them when I'm older. She told me that I had a couple shoulders and taught me how to look over them when I'm older. I know this seems cold, but I promise you, you understand when you're older. Baby, baby, when you're older, uh, I promise look, you, you understand. I was looking crazy on the ass, right? It was awkward in the hood without a dad, like school days was a trip. That ain't the half, right? Look, yeah, I had some thoughts about that fast life. See my niggas hitting corners like a man that can't drive. Man alive, thank God. Pulling back they burners, getting ready for that bank ride. I ain't really about that life. Leave me at the crib, dog. I got brothers since they was 15. <laughs> biz off, fading in this alleyway. Thought I wouldn't make it out. These ball players cheating death. These haters trying to take them out. Fees on ready while I'm hitting heads. He's on my life goals, bugging out my mind. Reality ain't not a sight though. Just a rapper out here making movies with this Kodak Black. Hold up, I ain't mumble that. Nah, I ain't the one for that. <laughs> I can rain the time on the 64 with the rumble pack. Hard times will make you double back. Uh, run it back. Hard times will make you double back.